We've got some fresh new young talent doing some things that I know you haven't heard before. One, two, three, listen. Welcome to Finances, your home for all things financial, investment, money, and lifestyle. Hosted and curated by the very talented team of certified financial planners and Burke Britain Financial Partners. So this is the, the Finances Podcast. Uh, I'm Jay Burke, I'm joined by Ben Kemp, uh, and today's guest is Tara Patch. I checked before we started, <laughs> Tara, that uh, your surname spelled P-A-A-T-S-C-H is in fact, well, we'll, we'll phonetically, we'll, we'll say that it's Patch. It is, yes. <laughs> so welcome, welcome, to, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. No worries. Now, I might give you a, just a little, a tiny little bio so people can understand who you are and then we're going we're gonna to get you to give us a little bit more of a backstory of yourself and uh, where you grew up and uh, how you came to be sitting here with us today. Uh, but Tara Patch is a special counsel in the Harwood Andrews Family Law Practice Area. Tara joined Harwood Andrews in the early 2020 or 2020 after practicing for several years in Geelong and exclusively in the family law jurisdiction jurisdiction you know, since 2014. Uh, I might uh, pause there, Tara, and we might hand over to you. Uh, does that is it do a fair job of explaining uh, your role at Harwood Andrews in family law? Or have you got a little bit more you want to add to that? Oh, that's, that's the basics. Um, so I joined the team just a couple of weeks before the pandemic hit, so that was interesting times. Um, had a couple of weeks in the office and then went into working from home for a couple of years, but pretty much covering off on every area of family law. So um, property settlements, parenting matters, divorces, child support, uh, you name it, we're, we can do it. You've got, you've got a lot on your plate <laughs> by the sounds of it. Uh, now, before we jump into all things family law, I know there's a fair bit to cover off on, but we all, Ben and I always like to uh, start with a bit of a background story of our guests. So let's talk a little bit about where you were born. I cheated before we started and I asked you that and I said I probably shouldn't have asked, I should have waited for the podcast. But let's let's start with where you were born, uh, where you grew up, uh, where you went to school and how you ultimately found yourself at Harwood Andrews in uh, special counsel in family law. Sure. Uh, well, I'm reasonably local. I was born and grew up in Colac. Uh, I was at school in Colac up until my last couple of years, uh, year 11 and 12, and I came on the bus every day down to Geelong College. Uh, How long does it take to get to Geelong? Oh, uh, it was a bit over an hour. So oh, wow. we'd, yeah, we'd leave Colac about 10 past seven in the morning and get here about, we'd go the back way and pick up all the kids along the way. <laughs> um, got to school about 8.30 and uh, then got home about five o'clock. So. It's a decent chunk of your day. It was a decent chunk of the day. It was. But Do you have fond memories of the bus, or was it uh, was it dread? No, I really enjoyed it. I made some really nice friends on the bus, and actually, it was not a bad wind down time um, after school, in particular, before you then got home and got stuck into some homework. So, yeah. was that a college specific bus, or were there kids from all different schools on the bus? It was mainly college, but there were a couple of kids, I think, from Cadinia um, that jumped on the bus with us, but mainly college. So. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. So Geelong College from primary school? No, for, just from 11 and for a year 11 and 12. Okay. So if you go back a little bit further than that, whereabouts did you go to school primary school sure. and for your early secondary school? All right. Well, I was at a primary school called St. Mary's in Colac. Uh, and then I went along to Trinity College yeah. in Colac from year 7 to year 10 and then came down to Geelong College for year 11 and 12. What was the culture shock like moving out of <laughs> Colac? So St Mary's is a good Catholic uh, primary school yes, in, in, uh, in Colac. Colac. Yep, Trinity, the good Catholic uh, secondary school there. And uh, I loved it. I was pretty keen by that stage to be spreading my wings a little bit and getting out of Colac. I mean, it was a lovely place to grow up, but once you hit those kind of late teenage years, you yeah after a bit more excitement. <laughs> did you have an idea of where you wanted to go? Like you wanted to get out of Colac, but whereabouts mm. did you want to go? Were you thinking Big Smoke, Melbourne, overseas, or Geelong? Well, <laughs> I I initially, so leaving Colac, I, my plans, my aspirations were to do court reporting. So I wanted to do journalism <sighs> okay. and go to court every day and report on cases that were um, 
being heard in, in court. <laughs> so why, why was that? What was, yeah. what was I, the drag to that? That's my <laughs> 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 High school, I, I, I'm not sure I knew what the hell I yeah. wanted to do. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I just, I loved sort of your typical murder mystery um crime books all those sorts of things was I this was in like, high school so yeah, like early high, high school, school or yeah. late high school no, this is about year nine year ten this was my plan was to uh go to uni do journalism and be a court reporter so <laughs> there had to be some moment or there had to be something that happened in your life that sort of prompted you to think that that was going to be your path can you think of anything was nothing, there a- nothing specifically i just really so i did some work experience at the um geelong advertiser when okay. i was in I don't know, whatever year you do work experience, year nine or ten. Um, really enjoyed it. Uh, I don't think I went along to court or anything like that, but the, the journalism, the crime, the all those aspects of it, I thought, wow, that'd be a great gig going um I really liked legal studies. A great gig going along oh, to court we, every day. Every day. Going to court. Can you can you remember what your work experience was? Because I remember what mine was. Mine's a bit boring, but I did a week as a financial planner. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I did a week at uh, Norlane Waterworld, and the, the water f- day one they had me teaching. cleaning bird shit off the <laughs> outdoor pools. So anyway. didn't didn't go down that path. <laughs> I didn't go down that path, so maybe it. Uh, I'm I'm glad. I'm glad I didn't follow my work experience. You obviously did. And uh, were you doing legal studies? Was legal studies a thing at school in sort of year nine, year ten? Yeah, so it started in, I think, year 10, and I certainly followed that through to secondary school um, at Geelong College. I did it as one of my year 11 and year 12 subjects. But by that point, I realised, well, if I, if I don't specifically go straight into journalism, I could do a law degree and then um, always continue down that path of court reporting, but with a law degree instead of a, a journalism degree. Okay. Uh, and so... That's, you, that's just, you still haven't made it to the journalist part. Still haven't made it to the journalist part. Although here I am doing the podcast, this could be the so start. Maybe this is the beginning. <laughs> so, so heavily into journalism, writing, uh, writing, legal studies, murder mysteries. Yes. Uh, year eleven and year twelve. Again, you still had that sense that that's what you wanted to do when you finished at Geelong College in year twelve. How did you go in year year eleven, year twelve? Really good. I really enjoyed it. Um, I made a lot of friends at college, so that was really nice and a lot of connections and opened my eyes to the big wide world outside of little Colac. Uh, So yeah, finished up at college and then uh, headed down to Monash Uni to do an arts degree. At what campus? Uh, At Clayton. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So straight into Melbourne. So did you say an arts degree? Mm. Okay. So you didn't. You didn't do a law degree straight up. I did not do a law degree. Straight didn't do up. journalism straight up. I didn't do journalism straight up. I. <laughs> I wanted to get out of. So by that stage, I'd had a couple all my life in Colac. I'd had a few years in Geelong. Um, I I could have done law, at Deakin in Geelong, yep. and I decided I wanted to go to Melbourne. And so I did. So that's kind arts. of a gap year, was it? But, well, <laughs> kind of. But I did finish the degree. I did finish the arts degree. But I wanted to be doing law i wanted to be doing uni in melbourne okay not so, so yeah. what year was this without uh, uh getting your disclosure age or anything like that but what year did you graduate from school i finished school in 2001 2001 yeah. and so then you did a three-year arts degree i did yep. lived in melbourne that whole time no <laughs> so at the time i was dating a footballer yep and he was playing for sydney and so i did the first year of my arts degree at Monash and then I moved up to Sydney and finished my arts degree up at uh, University of New South Wales. Okay, great. Mm. Yeah. And then so you got to the end of that degree living in Sydney. Yes. That's the real big smoke after coming yeah. from Colt. Hey? <laughs> yeah. So you finished the degree living in Sydney. Yeah. What happened after that? Then I upped the ante again and I went to London. Okay. <laughs> is this your gap year? This or is my this is my gap year. Um, so I went to London Worked, travelled, um, just worked in a restaurant and bar over there and had a grand old time tripping around. Did you move to London to hang out with all the Aussies? Is that whereabouts did you live in uh, in London? I mixed it up a little bit. I was in St John's Wood for a while, which was pretty central. Um, Abbey Road, Beatles yep. <laughs> vibes. <laughs> yep. And I ended up heading down to um, a little place called Tadworth, which is in Surrey, where there was actually an Australian couple that were running a bar and restaurant there that hired me as their kind of secondhand um, manager, if you like, and yep. they'd head off 
traveling and I'd manage the pub for them and then they'd come back and we'd swap it around and I'd go and travel around and yeah so I did that for a year yep and while I was away I applied for law and got into law so whereabouts uh, I got in at Deakin Deakin Geelong well I actually did it by correspondence so I did my entire degree online from London no I did come back to Australia (laughs) but I didn't have to be anywhere in particular so I spent some time in Sydney I spent some time in Melbourne I spent some time in Colac, Geelong, all over the place. So that's kind of 2006-ish, 7-ish? Yes, 2006. Was was online study a thing back then? It was, but it wasn't particularly common. um, And it was whether it was going to be challenging because obviously you'd have to do all of your study at home. They had online lectures that had been recorded. Oh, they did have I was going to say, was it online or was it just a post a book out and you work your way through no, it? No, so that you could listen to the lectures being recorded. Yep. There was the forums for, instead of formal tutes, you would um, just go on the forums with your questions and there were the um, lecturers that would be answering things online. So it was probably quite innovative for the for the time. Yeah, it feels more like a, a 2020 kind of thing rather than a 2007 kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, so t- 2006... For, for three years, uh, I did my degree, my law degree online, remotely. Wow. Mm. How'd you go with your law degree? How'd you perform? I think I did pretty well. Yeah. I did really well in the subjects that I had always had an interest in, so things like evidence and um, criminal law, family law, things like that that I was particularly interested in. Probably didn't do as well in some of the... I'll be controversial, but more drier subjects okay. like con- constitutional law and things like that. <laughs> I, don't th- I don't think that's controversial <laughs> at all. <laughs> well, some people, that's their, that floats their boat. Yeah. Not for me. Um, but yeah, got through law degree relatively unscathed and then needed to get my first job out in the, in the world of law. So I applied for a couple of different roles and ended up down starting out my career at Madden's Lawyers in Warrnambool. So I was the... So back near the old... Uh, back the near old, the, the old, old stomping ground. Stomping ground, yeah. exactly. Uh, I started out... So I was the, f- the first year of the new traineeship system. So prior to that, it had been called Articles um, when you did your first year in the workforce as a lawyer. And they implemented this new system where you had to be a bit more structured about rotating around certain areas to get the required experience experience and people ticking off that you're not just photocopying or making (laughs) coffees in a corner you're actually doing legal work (laughs) so I was the first year of this new traineeship system Uh, it was quite similar to articles but uh, I got to do actual legal work and not make coffees and photocopy so it was great so you did get quite a a broad brush of all the areas of law i did what what did madden's focus on were they a general practice or were they specific to a particular type no so general practice so i rotated around through property uh litigation family law wills and estates uh, some personal injury i got a pretty wide variety of experience commercial law uh so a bit of a taste of everything were you drawn to the family law from the outset or was that something that just you fell into? Uh, I fell into it. Yeah. So I, I did uh, kind of helping out in various areas when people were heading off on maternity leave. I'd sort of backfill yep. roles, uh, which was great. But I certainly realised that property law and commercial law were not going to be my calling pretty early on <laughs> in uh, that process. I just really didn't really enjoy the, you know, commercial leases and yep. conveyancing aspects. Has that got something to do with the lack of people contact? Yeah. I think I think so, yeah. And that was the part I really quite liked was the meeting people. So I, I was more drawn to your personal injury, wills and estates, family law, just because of the different people you got to meet and the, the client interaction, definitely. So were you starting to think, as Ben said, you were starting to think family law maybe or had you still not quite decided that this was? you still had a few other options? I hadn't quite decided. Uh, I was open to anything that involved people and that involved ideally litigation. That was my 
that was my plan. Did so, you dream of being in a courtroom? Did you watch some of those uh, shows like <laughs> The Firm or, or <laughs> Suits? I haven't seen Suits, <laughs> but uh, is that when you grow up? Is that what you're dreaming of? The sort of the Hollywood picture of of uh, a litigator, or not so much? Well, to some extent, because obviously I had that aspiration right back from when I was interested in court reporting. So the the court and the litigation aspect was obviously a big part of it for me. Um, the the judges, the process, the the fighting possibly yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah that that was definitely a big draw card for me definitely so maddens for how many years before you then moved on to your next uh next role mm, so three and a half years in warnable at maddens and uh my husband and i then got married and we thought we might want to start a family so we thought it might be a good idea to move back a little bit closer to where our family was and uh, we had family in Colac, Melbourne and Geelong. So Geelong was quite a good central spot to stop. Yeah. yeah. And whereabouts did you meet your husband? Uh, he's from Colac as well. Okay, yes. there you go. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I've, I've known him for a very long time, um, right back to when I was in school. And uh, yeah, we went, I went back there one weekend and caught up and the rest is history, rest is history. Yep. <laughs> how long after that did uh kids arrive so you've uh, you mentioned before the podcast that you've got uh you've got a few young kids you've got three yes. three kids what's yep. the mix of your kids so i've got two girls and a little boy mm -hmm. and uh, my eldest is almost nine and my youngest has just turned four so we got my husband and i got married in 2012 yep early 2012 and by mid 2012 we'd moved to geelong and i'd secured a role um, here at Geelong with Colt Illegal uh, in litigation, interestingly okay. enough, not in family law. And um, yeah, then we had our first daughter at the end of 2013. Fantastic. Mm. How did you, uh, I know we're, we're getting there, we're getting yeah, to the current day, but uh, <laughs> how did you manage? I mean, obviously, uh, you've, did you have your kids in reasonably quick succession, did you, you said? Uh, yeah, yeah. How did you manage uh, a professional life and managing three kids or one then two then three yeah so i ever since i've had children i've worked part times haven't gone back to work full time and i'm very lucky that my husband his role is such that he starts work really early in the morning and he's done by lunchtime so the mornings are a bit chaotic because it's me on my own with the three kids getting them to where they need to be um, the afternoons are a bit chaotic for him because it's him on his own with the three kids uh, but it allows me to work three full days without having to cut and do school hours or anything like that so that's the juggle at the moment that's a decent juggle too yeah. isn't it it's a it's a it's a big big responsibility on the home front as there is uh, on the work front so Coulter Roach for or Coulter Legal I think they yes, were Coulter Roach previously were, yes. now Coulter Legal uh, how long were you at Coulter Legal before you then moved on mm, so I was there seven and a half years so quite a while um three kids during that time so a couple of different stints of maternity leave but had a really really enjoyable time there and it wasn't until I was coming back from maternity leave after my first daughter that I'd been dabbling a bit in the family law team and the litigation team prior to my maternity leave so when I came back I just really needed to make a decision I couldn't have a foot in two teams it was just going to be too challenging working part-time and all the other things that go along with that so um, the family law team needed me and off I went I've been family law ever since then. Do you miss the litigation stuff or is it you happy with that transition? Um, well, family law is litigation. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. More, more often yeah. than not. Yeah. Uh, not always, but yeah. there is definitely the litigation aspects of it. So it just means the subject matter in family law is a bit more specific, whereas in litigation you could be dealing with anything from, you know, food to windows to <laughs> anything. Yeah, any kind of yeah. topic matter. Yeah. yeah. So when did you join? Howard Andrews. So that was at the start of 2020, uh, just three weeks before the pandemic hit. I started there and had the three weeks in the office, went to Fiji for a week. And while I was away, the world went mad. And then you didn't I worked, get stuck in Fiji? We did not get stuck in Fiji, but we did fly home on the Friday night just before the Sunday night um, hotel quarantine mandate came in, or the, is the isolation mandate came in. So we only scraped in by the skin of our teeth. <laughs> Without having to do two weeks isolation. That'd be fun. Yeah. <laughs> Three kids. <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> yep. Uh, but yeah, so I did a couple, couple of years from home pretty much since I've started with Howard Andrews and uh, now we're 
back in the office and things are slowly getting back to normal. What do you prefer, particularly in, I suppose, in family law specifically? How difficult is it to, to operate remotely or via Zoom and calls versus actually sitting down with people uh, one-on-one? I think for, at the very least, that initial meeting with people, it's really good to have that in person to make sure that you've got the right dynamic and um, they can see you and and have a proper chat with you. But beyond that, uh, it's quite easy to do it, email, over the phone, uh, Zoom or Microsoft Teams if you need to. But certainly that, that very first appointment I think is pretty important to do in person if you can. Yeah, yeah. That, that probably brings us to sort of the family law process I suppose because I know when we're talking to clients there's a lot of when we start to talk about family law it it, it feels very awkward for people like it it feels very uncomfortable and sometimes it's it's a bit like talking about estate planning and death it's something that we don't really want to talk about but it's kind of really important particularly when you're in the moment of thinking listen I've got to do something I was mentioning to you just before we started recording that I had a our last guest uh, Tam Shields is a friend uh, explained to me her experience of, of divorce and separ- separation, then divorce, um, and that sense of feeling really alone uh, and like that she'd done a, a bad job in managing her affairs that brought her to this point. So I think it's such an important it's such an important process, but it's so important to actually surround yourself with the right people, i.e. financial advisors, friends who have actually experienced before, and also family lawyers who can point you in the right direction. So let's, let's talk about the process itself of family law. How do people actually find themselves sitting down with you uh, to, to talk about uh, their, their circumstances and where they go to from, from here? Mm. Well, you're right. It's definitely a very um, confronting and pretty emotional area of law and family lawyers were sort of a necessary evil really um, to help be one of those support networks to help guide people through it. So um, sometimes someone might have separated and they immediately want to know how the process works so they would make an appointment to come in and meet with us and have that initial discussion. They might not be ready to progress anything just yet but just to know how it works for when they're ready to move forward. Uh, Other times we meet with people in the lead up to their separation so they might think um, things aren't going well and might be looking at separating so I need some advice on how to progress things if and when we do. Uh, And other times we've had people that have been separated for many, many years and might never have formalised a property settlement or things might have gone really well with their parenting matters by agreement but then a new partner's come on the scene or something's gone pear-shaped which has caused things to... um, you know deteriorate and that might be the point in time when they come in and get some legal advice about whatever's happened percentage wise what's the breakup of people that come preemptively those that come right in the midst of separation and those that are maybe just tidying up uh <laughs> tidying loose up ends. A, yeah loose ends yeah huge mixture uh i i wouldn't like to speculate because i see clients from all different ranges of that timeline so uh yeah it's a real mixture of people do you see many people trying to do this themselves and then just getting it awfully wrong is that is that a growing amount of people or is it just a constant what we often see is um well the advice i certainly give is the more you can do yourself the cheaper and easier it will be and you're not paying a lawyer to do it for you but Sometimes that's easier said than done, particularly if there's pretty high levels of conflict between people. So uh, often I see people, we we have a meeting, we talk about how it works, and then they might go away and try and negotiate things themselves and try and sort some things out. If they can't, then they'll obviously come back. Uh, If they can, they might be coming back to us just to help them formalise it. So... It feels like people, I've seen this from clients where they're, they're trying to save a few dollars but just end up creating more expense at the end of the day because it just spirals sometimes that can happen yes absolutely so it is important to get well it's not the first thing you should do obviously there's some practical Mm -hmm. considerations um you know if someone needs to move out if you need to make some day-to-day arrangements for finances and children and things like that but it certainly is a good idea to get some legal advice from a family lawyer not too long after you separate um, because the longer you leave it uh, the, the longer you're going to remain financially tied to each other. So, 
the three examples you gave us sort of the preemptive client the one that's in the middle of the midst of the chaos and then one that's trying to tidy up loose ends the person who comes to you preemptively thinking about potentially separating what type of questions are they asking you mm. the one we often hear is i want to know how much i'll get uh, which is, you know, almost like a, the typical lawyer answer. It depends on how long is a piece of string because it very much does depend on personal circumstances, what there is available to divide in terms of an asset pool, what the contributions and the future needs of the parties are. So it's not going to be something that in that initial appointment we can say, right, you, you should be getting 52.8% and that's it, off you go. So I think that that is definitely a common misconception that people... Uh, are under the assumption that the law states that you divide equally assets, but that's not the case, is it? No, it's uh, not and, at and, all. And, just, and like everything, it depends it and depends. it's complicated. Exactly right, yes. So there's no automatic percentage, there's no automatic entitlements, and every matter is completely different. Um, it, is, it a, is it possible to apply rule of thumb or uh, precedent to the division of assets. So is there a starting point where, you know, we look at the total asset pool, it starts at 50-50 and then is swayed one way or the other dependent upon how long people have been together, their contribution to the relationship, uh, children, uh, people's ability to earn an income in the future. Are all of those things taken into consideration uh, or do we just throw it all against the wall and guess? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, you've hit the nail on the head. All of those things are taken into consideration. So the starting point is what is the asset pool um, or the pie that we've got available to divvy up and how much of those thing, are those things worth? So another common misconception is that you might just be looking at what the parties own in joint names or what they've bought during the time that they were together and that's not actually the case. So what we need to assess is absolutely everything that either of the parties own or owe and that's in the pool. And then from there we look at um, if there's reason why one per person should get an adjustment of that pool or, or changing of the ownership of how things are held uh, based on what they each had at the commencement of their relationship. So what would it be an example of that? Because again, you hear this a lot. Yeah, I was going to say, the, and the other part is you've got to actually get a value like the you, you would hear this and you know, they say it's worth this and she thinks it's or he thinks it's worth that and then actually it actually to verify that value would be Sometimes. a challenge in, in or some come to agreement about agreement yeah. of value is, exactly is a right. challenge to start with before you even get to the next step it can be so sometimes with someone selling a property because neither party is able to retain it for example the value will be what it sells for so you yeah. don't need to go don't down the to. path of getting a formal valuation or anything like that yeah. um more so when people are more amicable, they might just agree to a value. So they, you know, jump on Red Book for their car and they think, yes, it's worth 15000 and they're both happy with that and they're yep. happy to attribute that value. Uh, but you're absolutely right. If they can't agree, then we need to go down the path of getting a formal valuation. So be it a sworn property valuation, yep. uh, valuation of plant and equipment, whatever it might be that we need to actually value. Um, superannuation statements, yep. bank account statements, all of that financial disclosure. I, I probably should have added a disclaimer at the start that obviously what we're talking about today <laughs> is not personal, financial or legal advice. You, you should go and speak with Tara or speak with Ben and Jay if, uh, if you need personal advice. But I don't want to put you on the spot with giving us definitive answers on these things. But an example of assets, because I, I can think of a number of clients that uh, we've dealt with where... Uh, one of the parties has said, well, I had that property before our relationship started. So I, I owned that property before we were together. So that's mine. H how is that considered? How do you deal with those kinds of things where people come to the party or come to a relationship with inequality in their asset bases at the beginning? H how is that actually looked at and valued over the the term of someone's relationship up mm. until the point where they separate. Mm. So that property, even though they might have had it coming in and even though it might be in their sole name, it's still in that asset pool that's available for division between the parties. And where that contribution will be assessed is in the next step, which is why do we have what we have? So at the commencement of the relationship, I had a property coming in. It's not just that you had the property. It might be um, if the property was worth the same amount 
as the mortgage that you had secured by that property, then that property had no equity coming in. So it's not really worth anything. It's worth it's zero. Not, it's not going to change anything. Exactly right. Um, if the property had significant equity in it, but you've been together for 30 years, it's probably not going to change anything in the who gets what coming out the other side. If you've been together for two years and someone's coming with a property worth a million dollars, then that's obviously going to have quite a significant impact on who walks away with what. So the length, the length of time, and again, sort of I know this intuitively and also in practice, having dealt with a number of these situations, but why does the length of time, so just for, for anyone who's listening out there who you know, has no idea about this, why does the length of time of a relationship uh, influence what's considered a divisible, that separation? Mm. So that's basically been the court's approach that uh, the longer you've been together, the time has eroded some of those initial contributions because there's been a lot of water under the bridge and a lot of other contributions and things that have gone on during your life. So it's not just as simple to say, well, the property that I had at the start that was worth $30,000, but now it's worth $3 million. Um, it, it wouldn't be just and equitable or fair off the back of a really long relationship to give that a much higher weight than, for example, the other party's contributions, which might have been going to work every single day and applying their income to, you know, all your, all your daily living expenses or caring for children, not so, working. So that, that last point, it's not necessarily just about a monetary contribution towards a relationship. It's about the contribution that that individual has been able to make that has allowed their asset pool to be where it is after 20 or 30 years. Exactly right. So it's the contribution, not only what the parties each might have had coming in, it's the contributions that have occurred during the relationship, including as a homemaker or a parent, because it's not always fair just to say, well, someone bought more money and so they get more. Uh, more often than not, that means there's been someone else on the home front doing more of that work. Uh, and then also looking at contributions post-separation, if there's been you know, quite a period between separation and when the parties might be doing their family law property settlement and um, also the future needs of each of the parties. So looking at things like care of children, income earning capacity or disparity of income earning, health, life expectancy, all of those sorts of factors. Sounds like that that initial appointment for someone who is preemptively thinking about separation or divorce is kind of super important. Like even just hearing you say that about the complexity and the things to consider and sort of blowing away some of the assumptions that people have in their mind that, listen, this is what we're going to agree to. That seems fair in my mind. But what we know is that that might be the case when things are amicable. In a lot of instances when people are separating, it may not be. So understanding what your what the law says. Yep. And also having someone help you work out what is reasonable, what is unreasonable, is uh, is a pretty important step. It is. And we do often see a lot of people coming in with a lot of those misconceptions yeah. about um, only certain things being included in the pool or that automatic 50-50. Um, we also see a lot of people that might have been in a de facto relationship that somehow think it's a six-month uh, time limit. I was going to ask you about yeah, that. I wasn't sure where. Yeah. Is it, maybe you roll that into it now. Is you know, Do you have to be married for these things to apply? No. Or, so no. the legislation is the same. Different sections ref of the Act refer to married couples and de facto couples, but the, the considerations in the legislation is the same. So whether you're married or whether you're de facto, whether you're same sex, um, it, it's all the same considerations. Yeah. When do you become de facto? Well, uh, technically, it depends, uh, it depends <laughs> yeah. pretty much. That's my stock standard answer. Uh, technically, it's two years, but there are exceptions to that rule. So, for example, if you have a child together, yep. uh, if one of the parties has made significant financial contributions... Um, it, how do you define significant? Well, it, it comes down to the circumstances of okay. the it depends. Yeah, it depends. <laughs> it depends. It depends. Yep. Is that like if they purchased a house together or something like that would be, potentially yep. be a trigger for that? Exactly. Yeah. So if, if parties had purchased a property in their joint names, um, then how on earth would that be resolved or that be addressed if we didn't have jurisdiction to address it via the family law system? So, yes, yeah, certainly some, some things like that that, that crop up. Um, I mean, there's been cases of 
de facto relationships where it's been a, an affair or a, or a mistress. So you don't even have to have necessarily lived together. Um, there, there's been de facto family law applications off the back of, you know, parties that have is that been a, having it, an affair. Is that around uh, showing dependency? It is. So, yeah, that, that financial dependence or interdependence is another one of those it depends factors. Okay. Um, but the, the standard rule, if you like, it's not six months, it's two years, but unless one of the exceptions apply. Okay. What about if you're leaving your toothbrush at a, at a, at a girlfriend's house or something <laughs> like that? Do they take all those things into consideration? Uh, yes, the duration of the relationship, um, where you might have stayed, uh, a, a whole range of things, you know, what you might have portrayed to other people as to whether you're in a relationship, so whether you're rocking up to each other's family Christmases and mm. special family functions and introducing the person as your partner. So a, a whole range of things that could go towards showing that there is a de facto relationship or that there's not. There's not really anything black and white about it. Is it? It's all sort of grey. It's just <laughs> Well, there's there's a lot of case law about it. Yeah, so um, that's what you use. But it's, to... yeah, it's, there's, there's a checklist sort of a checklist. There's some examples that are included in the legislation of things that might constitute a de facto relationship, but it's it's not a hard line it's because again, <laughs> it's always but and it's yeah. always it depends because everyone's circumstances are so different. Yep. Mm. And I think what one of the things that makes it even greyer is the emotional aspect. Like all the things that you just spoke about, I can imagine uh, two parties where they're each t- trying to dispute the other they're trying to say well i went to the christmas party but uh you know i uh, the, the only time i went or yeah. Uh, yeah. i you only just needed s- to bring someone <laughs> i needed to drop someone off so that y- you can see how the dispute can be so emotive and how very quickly it can get out of control yes yeah it can um, and that's why i throw back to at the end of the day the more people can negotiate and agree themselves without having to turn it into a big fight the cheaper and easier it will be but it's often easier said than done i've got an example a client a while ago and they they separated sold the house they owned together they're married they sold the house a couple of kids they worked out all their arrangements themselves and they're all fine they've got it you know moved on sort of but they haven't done anything from a formal sense yet is that still needs to be done doesn't it like they still need to go in and actually you know sort of agree that, agree that they've agreed and, yeah. and do those things. That's very, very important, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So when you're married, you're actually going to remain financially tied to each other until you do a formal property settlement yeah. or until the clock runs out, which would be 12 months after you apply and you receive a divorce order. Yeah. Uh, in a de facto relationship, there's a two-year time limit. So you've got two years after you separate to try and sort out and formalise the who gets what of the assets. Uh, Otherwise, on the face of it, you run out of time. Uh, Sometimes you can apply out of time, so outside of that 12 months after your divorce or outside of that two years after your de facto uh, separation. And you can plead your case, if you like, as to why you need uh, a family law property settlement, even though you're outside of the time. And sometimes you can be successful in that. But generally, it's, it's... Staying financially tied to each other until you do a property settlement, yep. um, or until twelve months after the divorce for a married couple, um, for a married couple, excuse me, or uh, the two years after a de facto relationship. That that scenario you're talking about sounds like the we talked about the three options or the three scenarios: preemptive, sort of in the middle of the the chaos, and then loose ends. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And again, yeah. for them, they they sort of you know the assumption from their end is we've done it all. Like, you know, we're all happy families move from, you know, so, so what, <laughs> they're very amicable about it, um, but there's still a need to formalise that, yeah, isn't there? There is, because there's a real risk that um, if one of those parties became unhappy mm. with the settlement at some point, or, well, you know, what, that, what yeah. they'd agreed at some point down the track, and often the trigger for that might be uh, a new partner coming on the scene or, you know, things that can cause a bit of upheaval during the relationship. Um they, uh, their, their former partner could come back at them because they're still financially tied to each other. Yep. So what the court in the family law system is looking at is what the parties own, what's in that pool at the point in time that the court's making the orders, not what the parties had when they separated or at some other point in time. It's what they've got. Not what they had a handshake agreement around no, separating. No, mm. exactly right. It's what they each own and what's in the pool and what the contributions and the like 
were at the point in time the court's making the orders. Mm. So, One of the questions that we asked to this point is when we meet a client for the first time, we ask them about their dependencies, we ask them about their marital status, uh, we ask them whether they've been uh, married, separated, divorced in the past because it, it's, it's amazing how many people have been married in the past uh, and we'll ask them, have you had a formal financial settlement and they'll say yes but they haven't no. they've just they've just had an like an agreement because it's been amicable at the time they've thought well you have the house i'll have the cash and they've got kids and they yeah. don't want to upset the apple cart but you know we're seeing more and more hopefully less and less over time but those clients actually wanting to tie up and needing to actually tie up the loose end so that they don't leave uh, the potential for future you get higher rates of and you know this better than us, so the higher rates of divorce and separation than in the past. So there's more people in the pool that, and then there's less of them that are, well, you know, just because of more numbers, there's higher chances people out there who haven't tidied it up and done it properly isn't there. So mm. we mm. seem to be finding, you know, blended families and then that complexity of the estate planning off that that we probably see more of. Yeah. Um, it's everywhere. Yeah. It's most the, the common thing. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's quite funny the uh, number of people that sometimes we see that have had unfortunately multiple, multiple. failed yeah. relationships and so they haven't even formalised their property settlement from the first partner and now on then they're on to a second or a God, you know, sometimes Some third, third, fourth, third, fourth um, relationship breakdown. And how do you establish what's in the pool the fourth time round if you haven't actually cut your ties properly the first time around so it becomes very very challenging uh so yes advice absolutely risk averse lawyer is going of a lawyer is going to tell you that you need to make sure you cut your financial ties as soon as and possible so it's, it's probably more about the time lag isn't it about doing these things again there's so much going on emotionally to to get those things in place i suppose the key being if you, you've got good support you can sort of outsource a majority of that work to someone like yourself that can get that done while they you know manage their own emotions and things as well yeah you can and as i said uh, you don't need to be racing in day one after you've separated there's obviously some practical considerations that you might you know yeah. and some mental health considerations yeah. that you might need to put first and make sure you've got that support network of your friends and family and psychologists and counselors and things but um, if you're waiting months and months obviously the nature of your assets for a property settlement is going to continue to change. Um, what things are worth is going to continue to change. So the longer you leave it, the more the pool is going to change and the harder it might be to identify the pool and what it's worth um, and, and you're staying financially tied to each other. So if you're getting on, on a year or so and you haven't done a property settlement, things have changed quite significantly during that time and you probably need to look at getting something to, to cut those financial ties. What's the longest you've had? Like what's the longest you've gone, <laughs> gone you know, oh, retrospective? I've, I've seen a case where the parties had been separated for 20 years wow. and yeah. they hadn't done a property settlement. So it's a long time. A lot can happen in 20 years. When you say property settlement, mm. just to clarify that, doesn't mean a property in terms of it means their properties. And, exactly. Yeah, so just, when, when so we talk about property... Because people talking, go, oh, we don't own a house. No, so, so yeah. it's not just a house. Uh, what, when we're talking about property in a family law context, it's everything that would be in that asset pool. So yeah. all of the assets, all of the debts, um, everything that they might own. Property's got a pretty wide uh, definition. So a yeah. any interest that they might have in anything, including businesses, trusts, superannuation. Super, yeah. 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 Yeah, and that, that's a, that's a tricky one in terms of doing it yourself. In terms of the super split needs to be administered and stamped by the court, doesn't it? It so does. That's so not something that people can just level up themselves. No, so they can either do that by way of something called a binding financial agreement, or they can do it by way of a court order. But yeah. no, uh, you can't usually just ring up your super fund and say, I "Flick wanna, a bit across." Yeah. It'd be nice to make our yeah. job easier for, for strategy, but. Uh, Unfortunately not, again. And that, that even when it goes through and is done properly, you still see people that don't fully understand and, you know, we've had to deal with the back end of that where they get a, you know, there's a rollover coming of their super from their par ex-partner and they need somewhere to put it and then manage the, the outcomes of that. We probably see a bit of that side of things, don't we? So, yep. The actual formal split of assets, what's it called? And what's, what's the process? So you've, let's assume that we've come to an agreement on the division of property. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens and what is it called? Sure. So uh, the, the overarching process is called a property settlement. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of ways that people can formalise a property settlement. 
The cheapest and easiest way uh, is by way of something called an application for consent orders. So that's an application to the court by agreement um, for the court to make an order or put their the court stamp, the court seal on the order to cut the party's financial ties. So that hinges on an agreement being reached either by the parties directly or with the assistance of lawyers. And they both sign on to this paperwork to seek that a court order would be made. Uh, another way to do it by way of agreement is something called a binding financial agreement, which is like a private contract. So there's no court involved. It's not overseeing anything. Um, the benefit of a private contract is it could be as unfair as you like to one of the parties because there's no one checking that it's fair that the court needs to be satisfied that the agreement even though it's agreed is just and equitable but a, a private contract or a binding financial agreement doesn't have that same requirement so uh, it's a it's a valid way of doing it both parties have to have lawyers uh, and in my experience it's usually a bit more time consuming and a bit more expensive because drafts of the contract or the agreement go backwards and forwards. Uh, am uh, I right in saying that that's become uh, fallen a little out of favour of recent time or is it the opposite? Um, I, I wouldn't say it's fallen any more out of favour. Um, my approach is always though, well, if we've got a fair agreement, why wouldn't we go down the cheaper and easier path of an application for consent orders? Unless there's particularly sensitive commercial information or something in in the pool or in the matter that the parties wouldn't want it to go before the court but if it's cheaper and easier and it's fair let's go down the path of an application for consent orders without going down that private contract because there's some pretty significant legal advice that the both parties have to have lawyers for a private contract or a binding financial agreement and the level of legal advice that the lawyers have to give the parties before they sign it is pretty significant um, about the pros and cons and the fact that they're opting out of the court system. So, uh, you know, I suppose why would you if you could go down the other slightly easier avenue? So most people go down that path, the application? I would consent. say most people, yeah. yes. Yeah. Not, not have, all people. Not all, but majority. Yeah. Yeah. You ever see a combination of both? So we've got the consent orders and then maybe uh, would it be spousal income support or something like that that might be dealt with as a as a binding financial agreement that's exactly right jay so yes you can try and extinguish the risk of either party making a claim for spousal maintenance uh, you can't do that through an application for consent orders but you can do that by way of a binding financial agreement so sometimes we do do a combination the other combination that we sometimes see is people um, entering into something called a binding child support agreement which would lock in their child support arrangements as part of an overall kind of financial settlement or financial terms that they've agreed. So is this generally, I know we're going down a couple of little rabbit holes, which I think are good. Uh, is this in large part to try and uh, I'll say avoid, but I, I know the child support agency is a, well, it's a nightmare. Like a, say, yeah, that's a moving feast, isn't it? Like is it whatever... Is this to avoid having them to continually report income in their situation? Is that is you lock sometimes. it in so you've got certainty over it? Yeah, so sometimes. So yeah. uh, a binding child support agreement might be able to cover off on what's called periodic child support, which would be like what a Services Australia or a... Yeah. Um, formerly known as the binding child, uh, sorry, the uh, child support agency, what they would implement, which would be a fortnightly, monthly, whatever it is, kind of payment. So a binding child support agreement could cover off on that periodic type child support. The other thing that we can cover off on is non-periodic things. So things like school fees, um, payment of extracurricular activities, uh, school books, uniforms, private health insurance, yep. uh, all of that sort of, those expenses for children that wouldn't automatically be factored into a child support assessment or a Services Australia assessment. What's your preference? It depends. It depends, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, for some people, it works far better for them to have an assessment through the agency, through Services Australia, because it's assessed based on care percentages. It's a very complicated calculation and formula. It's assessed based on current incomes. It's not locking them into something and it's reviewed regularly. Whereas a binding child support agreement, you lock it in, that's it. Uh, and for some people, that's not going to be workable or best. Uh, but for other people, it might be a really great outcome really good idea to have those sorts of things locked in the the second of our three scenarios of preemptive 
in the middle of the chaos and tying up loose ends in the middle those people that actually come to you having kind of sorted their stuff out yep. i mean it was nice to hear you say before that in a perfect world we like to see people being amicable coming to terms between themselves and then seeing solicitors when it's time to wrap it up and have you maybe tidy up some of those uh some of those loose ends uh from your experience um what are the what are the mistakes people make in coming to agreements themselves when when they come to you they said we've we've agreed we're, we're all good we're all happy can you just put it in some consent orders and let's get it before the courts let's get it done mm. so pretty commonly we see people just excluding things so saying we're just going to deal with the house we're not going to deal with super we're not going to deal with anything else we're just dealing with the house um, and that's what we've agreed so then when we meet with them and we explain that the pool includes everything that you own what might have seemed like a quite a fair agreement because they're divvying up proceeds of sale of a house in a particular way once you then factor in or oh, one of them's got significantly more super or whatever it might be that they own outside of that specific asset that they've been addressing could mean that the agreement that they've reached is particularly unfair and so if that's the case it's unlikely to be approved by the court because the court's going to say this isn't just and equitable and so then if they're still insistent on going down that pathway they have to do it by way of that binding financial agreement or the private contract because the courts just wouldn't stamp stamp it off no the court would not approve it even though they've agreed uh, if it's not fair and and the court's looking at the same things that lawyers are looking at and giving advice on in terms of the contributions the future needs uh, so if it's not fair based on those factors it's not just and equitable the court won't approve it and the only other way to formalize it would be by way of that um, binding financial agreement do you ever get a couple coming to see you who are amicable and say uh, tara can you please write this up for us and let's send it to the courts mm. and do, do they ask that number two can they do that or does uh, each party have to go and seek their own independent advice? So both parties don't have to have lawyers, but certainly lawyers have very strict rules about conflicts of interest. Mm. So we would not, we certainly have those kind of inquiries where people ring up and say, we, we both just want to come in and see you and get it draft it up and, and get it finalised, we would not be able to see both parties. We can only see one of them. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the other person has to go and get legal representation if they don't want to. Um, if one lawyer is preparing the documents, if the other person's happy with it, they're welcome to go and get independent legal advice. But if they don't want to, they don't have to. They can act for themselves. Would they have to sign an acknowledgement that they, that they chose not to seek? advice themselves yes so as part of that application for consent orders uh, each party has to sign on to it and there's quite a detailed um, final page where you tick the certain boxes of the things you've done so you know you've been honest about the assets you've got um, you're aware of your right to have independent legal advice you either got it or you didn't okay so um, it, it's the right to independent legal advice yeah. it's not a definitive each party has to have independent legal advice. No, not in an application for consent Got orders. It. In a binding financial agreement, absolutely, you have to. Yeah, I know yes. the answer is probably it depends. But <laughs> what do you, what would you recommend parties do in that instance where you've you're, you say, listen, I can't act for both of you. What would your recommendation, if you could give a recommendation, what would it be in that instance? Mm. My advice is always to try and encourage their former partner to at least go and have an initial conversation with a family lawyer, not just any lawyer, because it is a very specific area of law with very specific knowledge and legislation. So encourage them to go and have that conversation, even if it means they don't then engage them to act in the process, at least they've had the rundown about how it works um, and, and the things that the court needs to consider in determining, yes, this is just and equitable and ideally making those orders that they've agreed upon. I think one of the concerns, and you probably hear this too, Ben, that people think that as soon as lawyers are involved, they're going to make people fight. They're going to say, listen, you're entitled to more, so you should go harder. Uh, you should, you, you're entitled to a greater percentage of that. I would assume 
well, you I, know, but uh, as lawyers, you operate under a, a duty of best interest to your clients. Uh, and it's obviously, obviously there's bad lawyers out there, the like there's bad financial a, advisors yeah. out there giving mm, poor yeah. advice and direction. But uh, I would argue that a, a good family lawyer is doing exactly what you spoke about. They're encouraging people to seek independent advice and they're encouraging people where possible to come to an amicable arrangement that's fair and reasonable and equitable for all parties. And if someone was to be in a situation where uh, they were, I suppose, being misguided or misdirected in that in that manner, um, they probably should seek support or advice from someone different. Yeah, yeah, exactly. so. I think there's that vested interest some people in the, the lawyer creating a conflict. Like, oh, they'll be able to rack up a bill on me if they create... There's this, like perception from people that, oh that, that's where it gets messy because they want to make a dollar out of it but it's probably more about what you said before if it's completely unequitable then the law, the, the court's not going to approve it anyway yeah. so that's where there's this misconception that that's probably where it gets created but yeah it's just a f- fact of law and look i can't speak for all lawyers but certainly for me someone that comes in to meet with me and they've fully agreed on their property settlement with their former partner that's pretty much the dream uh, the dream <laughs> client um, and I'm not trying to stand to you in the way to unpick that agreement that they've reached but I obviously have rules and um, as part of being a lawyer requirements on the advice that I have to give so it may well be that as part of that I say look I think you could have done a bit better out of this but I understand you've reached the agreement um, and you want to go ahead with it even though you could maybe press for a bit more Uh, I'm not here to try and unravel that agreement but I do need to be careful to ensure that I've covered myself because the last thing I want is someone signing on to something that then they come back a few years later and say well hang on I got a really bad deal and you didn't why didn't you tell me yeah Yeah. Yeah. and that that balance is really important I think that again it speaks to why it's so important to go and speak to someone and speak to someone that has your best interests in in mind but also speak to someone who knows the law and knows what's fair and reasonable and knows what is actually going to be rubber stamped at the end of the day when it when it hits the courts uh mindful of time we've uh, again we say this every time we could talk for hours because it, for us and i know for for listeners out there that are in this circumstance it's important stuff uh we might have to do a part two uh, yeah we might reconvene <laughs> for a part two if you're happy to join us again tara sure. but for those people out there that uh, are in the midst of, they're either preemptively thinking about uh, separating and need to speak to someone, they're in the they're amicable and they need a, a solicitor to wrap it up, or they've been <laughs> uh, separated for twenty years and haven't done anything <laughs> about it. Where can they get a hold of you? Where can they get in touch with you to uh, have a consultation and? talk about the situation sure so um we are in Jeringhap street uh we can offer initial consultations either either over the phone uh, in person or on microsoft teams or um, online if that's your preference and we do actually offer an initial complimentary appointment so we can come in and, and certainly not a session when we're sitting there talking very specifics of the percentage entitlements that you're going to get out of a property settlement but just to give you a bit of an understanding about what sorts of things are considered, how it works, the pool, the contributions, the future needs and things like that. So uh, we offer those initial appointments um, most days and uh, just comes down to people's availability and their preferences to how they want to have that first meeting with us. And where can they find you online? Sure. So we are at, uh, if you Google Howard Andrews, (laughs) we will pop up there um, and we have a, I've got an email, for example, tpatch at ha.legal. You want to spell that for us, Tara? Sure. T-P-A-A-T-S-C-H at H-A, as in standing for Howard Andrews, uh, dot legal, L-E-G-A-L. So you can always flick us an email uh, and let us know if you would like to tee up an initial appointment and we can arrange a time, do a conflict check and, and have that initial conversation about how it works. Do you want to just talk about a conflict check, what that actually is? Mm, so... Um, Lawyers have pretty strict rules about who they can act for. And so, for example, if I had given advice to someone's former partner, I couldn't then have them come in and give them advice because that would be determined, that would be a conflict of interest for me because I couldn't be acting in the best interests of both of those people. So what we do is we grab both parties' names uh, when you contact us. We search our system to make sure that there's no conflict, um, be that a 
a conflict where we've acted for someone in a family law matter or given them advice, be it a conflict over from a, a business law team or, you know, a personal so it's, conflict. So any, any matter that any that matter practices within, on? Any matter within the firm, okay. yes. Uh, and if that comes back clear, then we're able to obviously meet, meet with you and have that initial conversation and, okay. and act um, beyond that if you want us to act beyond that. Just looking at the Howard Andrews website, Tara, if we search Howard Andrews and Tara Patch, there is uh, also a, a section where you can click here to start your family law planning with Tara. Does that take us through to a to booking an appointment with you? How does that work? Sure. So we actually have an online system called Setify uh, where you can plug in some general information and it can sort of guide you through the beginnings of the process so you can fill in some information about what you might have in your asset pool um, children that you might have the circumstances of your relationship all of that is really helpful for us to have a read of before we have that initial conversation because then we can actually spend that time having a proper discussion with you about how it works and not just information gathering so would strongly encourage and certainly when people make an appointment with us we send them out a link to that certify form for them to start their uh, filling out their information so that we've got all of that. We can talk about the things that we need to and focus on the things that we need to in that first appointment. Great. Ben, have you got any closing comments or questions for Tara before we wrap no, up? No, I think it's been good. There's so many misconceptions, isn't there? And you would cop it all the time and we hear them again and we try and point the people in the right direction of the people that know, but it's complex. You just have to seek advice on so many things these days, financial, you know, legal, everything like that. So I think knowing people like yourself who have done it for such a long time and know all those ins and outs, you just have to lean on that and outsource it and can help them focus on their other parts of their, you know, relationship breakdown. They can outsource some of those things. So yeah, it's exactly been good. Right. And we're here to help. So we're not trying to scary. cause problems <laughs> for people. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, we're trying to make sure that they can wrap up uh, what they need to be it parenting arrangements, be it a property settlement, be it divorce, whatever it might need to be so that they can then move forward with those financial ties cut or with the, the line in the sand, if you like, so that they can move forward with their lives onto um, bigger and better things. Beautiful. Tara, thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, it was great. And we look forward to around two, diving a little bit deeper into all things family law and uh, maybe your, your history as well. So thanks great. for coming. Thank you. Thanks for having me. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you're keen to understand more about how financial advice could benefit you, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Burke Britain FP or Google Burke Britain Financial Partners. Check out our client reviews, testimonials, and make a time to meet one of our certified financial planners by clicking book now on our website. Thanks for listening. Any information contained in this podcast is of a general nature only. No account was taken as to the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. Therefore, before making any decision, listeners should consider the appropriateness of any information with regard to their particular objective, financial situation, needs, and seek independent advice from a licensed professional specific to their circumstances. All right, hit it. That translates to don't be a moron and act on what some random person says on a podcast. Take personal responsibility, do your homework, ask questions, and speak to an actual human that knows what they're talking about before you do anything. PP Financial Solutions Proprietary Limited Trading as Burke Britain Financial Partners are authorised representatives of AMP Financial Planning Limited AFS license number 232706.